options, but we're not going to have a fourth one. So I think it's enough for now. Next, we have Tal Heinrich. Tal Heinrich is an Israeli journalist and a news anchor here in New York. She's the host of TIJ Talks, an investigative journal and a contributor on Quick Hit. She previously co-anchored the primetime show Crossroads on I-24 News. She also worked in Israel and produced for CNN International. Um, and she also hosted a lot of shows on Israel's Channel 20, Wala News, and the Sport Channel in Israel, Channel 5. So thank you very much, Tal. Just so you know, Tal speaks fluent Hebrew, English, German, and Arabic. And I'm happy to call her my good friend. You should definitely follow her on Instagram because she has some amazing cooking lessons that she can show you and also nice segments from Quick Hit. So thank you for that, Tal. And now it's my absolute honor to also have Vladimir Dutier here with us. He's an American television journalist. He's been, he still is a national correspondent for CBS News and has been with them since 2014, following five years with CNN. He was a member of the CNN team that won two Emmy Awards for his coverage of the 2010 Haiti earthquake. And he won a Peabody Award for his coverage from Nigeria, um, where he covered the kidnapping of the schoolgirls by Boko Haram. He also reported from the Middle East on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and also from the streets of Bangkok during Thailand's political turmoil. Um, I know he interviewed President Trump, he interviewed former President Bill Clinton, and most importantly, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, <laughs> very important blood. Um, he loves his guitars. You can see right behind him, he has his guitars. And hopefully when coronavirus is over, he can play on them for us a little bit. And I'll tell you a little secret about Vlad. He knows his Krav Maga from Israel. It's been a bit of time in Israel. <laughs> maybe maybe he'll share his link with you. So thank you very much for um, joining us. And I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to ask all our three panelists one question, the same question. After that, I will go into um, different questions. And you're more than welcome to ask your questions inside the chat box. We'll open it up in the last 10 minutes for a live Q&A. So thank you for that. So as you all know, the coronavirus has touched all of our lives uh, from you know, commuting the, to work, to the work itself, to the content of our jobs. And I would like to ask our three panelists, you know, how has coronavirus affected you in terms of news coverage? How has your um, daily routine shifted? So glad if you can start and give us two minutes of a summary. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be with all of you. I'm glad to see uh, there's a nice uh, sized crowd. And uh, thank you again, Mr. Ambassador, for this opportunity. Um, you, you know, I think the, the the two things that have, there are three things that I would say that have probably um, sort of colored uh, how this pandemic has affected uh, what I do, what I think all journalists do. Uh, the first is uh, that I think as this progresses, as this continues, all of us at some point or another will find that this infection, this virus um, has touched somebody that we know, either directly or indirectly. Uh, and, and that I think is true for a lot of people, but um, it's certainly true for me. Uh, uh, not only were several of my colleagues at CBS News infected with COVID-19, uh, one sadly lost her life uh, to it, somebody that we were all very, very close to. Um, uh, Maria Mercator, who uh, some, perhaps some of you uh, may know her. Uh, she was a longtime uh, Deputy Foreign Bureau Chief for CBS News before transitioning a few years ago into talent development. Um, and uh, she was a multi-cancer survivor, had beaten cancer many, many times, um, and, and sadly uh, was not able to overcome this uh, horrible pandemic. So I think that that's gonna be the case for a lot of people. Um, whereas in the past, a lot of things that we covered were not in the abstract because we were there on the ground witnessing and bear, uh, bearing witness and, and reporting, but we could say that you know uh, the war in Syria, the civil war in Syria, I don't know personally anybody who's been in, uh, affected by that. But in this case, I think so many people are gonna have the very same experiences. The second thing I would say is that um, because of that, because of those experiences, uh, because of the fact that we are all locked down, in, in some instances, reporters have become part of the story. And, and I can talk about that as well. Um, in the case of Leslie Stahl at 60 Minutes, for example, um, who uh, recently uh, told uh, the world that she had been infected. There are reporters who are now um, sharing their experiences of having been infected uh, with the virus, which is very unique again from uh, where we were um, in the past. And then the final thing is just what we're doing here, which is normally we'd probably be 
at a location, perhaps at the consulate um, or somewhere else, maybe at the embassy in DC doing this. And here we are all uh, working from our homes. We're broadcasting from our homes. I have all this equipment in my, in my house um, for uh, the days that we are broadcasting here. And that has meant that sometimes, you know, in the past, all of us have gone to war zones or we've gone to uh, uh, natural disasters to cover it on the ground with our own eyes. And, and because of this pandemic and because of the risks, uh, we're not able to do that as, as we have in the past. So those are the three things I would say. Thank you so much for sharing that. Bikram, can you give us maybe one minute how it has affected you? Uh, good afternoon. It's so good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, obviously, uh, this pandemic has put us all under lockdown. So the only way where you can really communicate is um, online. And part of my work, a uh, huge chunk of my work actually, is working from home to prepare uh, my morning newsletter. So it hasn't impacted so much my, my daily routine, but obviously because we are limited, stuck at home, uh, one, um, there's limited resources in terms of meeting people, engaging uh, with people on a personal level and, you know, figuring out either personal stories or also on a one-on-one -on -one level, uh, you get more out of a conversation, about an com uh, online conversation or a phone conversation. But also uh, when you wake up in the morning, you drink your coffee and you head to work, you have this, first of all, your own time of walking on the street, going in the subway, uh, coming into the office where you can conduct your interviews, do, do your research and start writing. Whereas when I'm stuck at home, it's a whole different story. You have five kids running around. You can't really record interviews or transcribe uh, interviews and, you know, prepare work for the evening hours. So it, it, in, in that level, it's, it, it, it's been hard to adapt to that situation, but also impacted me on a personal level and Vlad uh, alluded to that, which is uh, reporters uh, don't like to be part of the story. They want to report uh, what they see or, or, or you know, what they convey uh, from profiles and interviews. And so when you become part of the story, you sort of uh, mix your emotions with your objective reporting. So. Uh, in terms of myself, because I live in a community which has been hardly, um, um, highly impacted by this pandemic, knowing a lot of people uh, have lost some family members and some friends, uh, you sort of have this emotional touch to this. So you become more, um, you know, knowledgeable on one hand, but also uh, you have this sort of, you know, how do I separate myself, my emotional feeling from um, hard reporting. And also uh, um, the third part is that, you know, when, especially when it comes to niche reporting where you report on specific topics and now with this global pandemic, you need to uh, broaden your knowledge, uh, but you read a lot, you see a lot of data that also impacts you because you get a lot of anxiety and you know way too much in order to situate yourself in a certain uh, uh, program or a certain segment that you want to cover. The Orthodox community and um, get a little bit insight from you as well. Um, and I hope your five kids are okay because it's very quiet there. So I don't know where you put them, but it's very quiet right now. I made um, sure they don't interrupt this conference. <laughs> Sounds good. Now, can you tell us a little bit from your perspective, how has the coronavirus affected your reporting? I think not Alex, even one. Can we unmute her? Oh. <laughs> I'm here. Okay, so I, I was about to say that I don't have five children running around, not even one yet. So my life is not that exciting at this period. But I have discovered, though, that this period, uh, just like any other industry, I guess, is um, it requires a lot of creativity and a lot of resilience. Uh, over, over the last year and a half, as, as you know, Almog, I barely had a chance, I think, to report in Hebrew. And nowadays, everyone in Israel wants to know, even the Israeli sports channel, they want to know what's happening in the U.S. So I have 
more opportunities to report back home to report in Hebrew, something that I haven't done in quite a while. So I find that pretty exciting. I uh, also utilize this time to work on a new initiative with kids that you mentioned before with my ex-colleagues. It's a daily roundup, very quick of 10, 12 minutes uh, roundup of, of international and, and national news. So, so there's that. And in terms of technology, uh, sometimes I have my boyfriend holding the light for me when I do live hits. Sometimes I go downstairs to the street to do it. And it's a, it's a one woman show. And then um, also the famous ironing board. I don't know if you've seen the, the clip that the Israeli consulate has put out, but you can see my home studio where I use my ironing board as a, as a desk for my, my computer. Very, very um, cute. But I think, um, you know, all of us are trying to build home studios. I have to say for this panel, I'm not a reporter. I did it once and it's very difficult, you know, with the lights and the table and how do you do it? But yeah, maybe I can get some tips afterwards. Um, so I'm going to move to, the, to one question for Vlad. Vlad, you talked a little bit about, you know, being part of the story. Obviously, you were first at the studio reporting about this coronavirus coming, um, hitting China, hitting Europe, and then suddenly CBS became part of the story. I think CBS was basically the first network um, to shut down and, and let everyone go home. Uh, one of your colleagues contracted it. So if you can go maybe a little bit deeper into describing um, what does your day look like? So how does it look like for you? Do you do the technical aspects? Do you have other people do it for you? And um, how is it from the perspective? Right, so technically speaking, um, I'm, I'm lucky in that uh, when the pandemic really started to uh, take effect here in New York City um, in early March, I was already working with a crew, in other words, a, a, a cameraman, a sound engineer, and a producer. And um, we were assigned to do the initial reporting on, uh, uh, on the pandemic and its effect on some businesses in, in New York City. And um, very quickly after that, when it became evident that we were not gonna be able to return to uh, the broadcast center, our bureau, um, the, the executives assigned this crew to me exclusively. So that um, given that we had already been working together and we made the decision that I would broadcast for CBS This Morning or the Evening News or for CBSN here from my apartment, um, they started, to, they were the ones that came in in the morning to set up the cameras, to set up the lights. And then after that, they were meant to go home directly and not uh, be assigned any other stories or be assigned any other reporters. So essentially what they were doing is coming here in the morning, doing the show, wrapping it up and then going home. And the only other interaction they would obviously have would be with their family members um, or if they needed to make runs to the grocery store. So, the, um, and, and because of that, I think we were able to, um, to limit uh, the interaction that the crew and myself had with other people. There's still a risk, obviously, because um, they get in their cars and they go home um, and uh, they perhaps go to the grocery store or they go to the pharmacy or whatever it is. But in the apartment, um, when they're here, we all wear masks. Um, we maintain six uh, feet, if not more, apart from each other. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a pain because when they leave every day, I have to disinfect um, the, the areas where, where they are. Um, but it's been now uh, almost, you know, we started in the first week of March and here we are, you know, in mid-May and it's been the same um, three guys with me uh, pretty much the entire time. My producer um, uh, is actually now able to uh, produce me from home. So now it's really just myself and the cameraman and, this, and the sound engineer. The producer uh, is at his apartment in Jersey City and if you watch our show in the morning, CBS This Morning, I have a monitor in, uh, behind me that will sometimes run the video elements. Um, and he's able to do that from his apartment in Jersey City. He's able to key the video into this monitor in this living room, um, which means that he doesn't have to come here. So the decision was made, you know what? Let's even limit um, uh, his interaction and have him work from home. So I have the two guys here. And, and you know, I think in the beginning it was sort of strange, but. It became evident, first of all, for me, as a reporter who's always on the ground or reporting from the field, um, this is, in my initial thought, it became just another live shot. In other words, just another um, uh, live shot location, which has happened to be the place where I go to sleep at night and have my dinner. Um, and now it's become, I think that, I don't want to brag, but when we first started doing this, we had two monitors. We had the, my regular television 
that um, is mounted on the wall here. And we had another television that I bought in from the guest room that I set up to run the video. And we had the graphic elements of our show um, or the video or the sound, uh, the sound bites. And gradually I started to see other people doing the same thing, other networks, NBC, CNN, ABC, everybody started to incorporate um, some of the things that we came up with in the early days. Now it's almost normal to see uh, uh, anchors and reporters from their living rooms with monitors behind them. I think when we did it, it was kind of unique. And um, essentially what it proves is that, uh, you know, the technology enables all re reporters, all journalists to be able to do their jobs, even if they can't be um, on the ground, um, in the hospitals, uh, or, um, you know, at the epicenter uh, uh, um, in, in New York City. Sharing a little bit how it goes behind the scenes, because I think it's, you know, things that none of us thinks about, you know, the monitor and the technical aspect and who's controlling what. And um, I think, you know, same as everyone, we're adapting to a new method. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I would like to move to Jacob and ask you, um, Jacob, I mentioned before, you're a prominent figure in the Jewish community. Um, you're on the Twitter list of top 50 um, Jews to follow on Twitter. So I want to talk a little bit about this complexity of, you know, being on one hand part of the community and on the other hand reporting also what's going on um, inside the community and obviously um, the pandemic has hit them as well. So can you tell us a little bit about that complexity? First of all, uh, it's tough um, on a daily basis because I wouldn't be here the place where I am right now um, if I didn't have this uh, courage uh, to speak out and to do um, untraditional things that uh, members of our community are not used to. Uh, it has uh, in some way, uh, uh, you know, while being a member of the community, knowing a lot what's happening, uh, being close to where it was uh, almost an epicenter uh, of this pandemic at the beginning, at the start, obviously uh, having more knowledge about the scope of gathering of, of how religious services actually impact um, our health and our um, daily lives um, battling this pandemic um, gave me a, a unique position to challenge authorities, to challenge the mayor, the governor at every opportunity to see at what level do they enforce those restrictions and if those restrictions are not enforced, how do they expect um, to reduce uh, this uh, virus, at least at the start, the, the, the rise uh, to, to flatten the curve, as they said. So on the one hand, uh, being a outspoken member of the community, uh, I received a lot of backlash because uh, as, uh, um, they call it uh, within the community. They say, "Don't don't clean your laundry in public." And so, in on one hand, as a reporter, I'm here to report the facts, to uh, document what is being done on ground. And if I experience uh, a violation of social distancing, I'm not going to think twice. I'm going to post it on social media. It's not because I want to make a name of myself or uh, to get retweets. No, uh, it's because I'm not going to hide anything that I see in the name of being a member of a certain community. Again, it comes with responsibility not to be reckless, not to shame a community, or not to imply that these violations are done by a majority of a community, and to specifically call out those who violate it but it has been challenging as well because until now, uh, the scope of my reporting is mainly on the Middle East, um, national Jewish related stuff uh, and Israel. And suddenly I come back to my hat that I kicked off my journalistic career in 2013, which are local issues and interacting with the local politicians about uh, issues that specifically impact us as New Yorkers, not specifically the Jewish community. And so to see a Jewish reporter focus on health issues, on issues that impact all New Yorkers is a little challenging, number one, for me to find my voice, but also to
to target a specific audience. And so on the other hand, you know, uh, walking around on the street and getting these comments as if, you know, I'm an informer, I'm a snitch, uh, um, having the need to actually uh, block people from following me on Twitter because they curse me or wish me death. You know, these things are very challenging for a human being, but it's also challenging because I have to separate myself being a member of uh, the Hasidic community, but also in my uh, professional uh, work, being a reporter reporting what I'm seeing and uh, um, highlighting um, instances where um, it requires the attention of our local elected officials. But, but I would just add also that it has also made me an address of people reaching out, uh, questioning uh, about certain requirements and uh, uh, guidance on specific issues and also uh, informing me on, 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 you know, on social distancing violations. So I don't need to actually be on ground. Uh, um, the information flows in, but it has also put me in a position where I have to now speak out for those who are afraid to speak out, to uh, represent those who don't have a voice. And I don't like to be put in a spot. because I think that was very, very personal insight. And I can tell you from my perspective and I guess everyone's perspective, we really appreciate the work that you do. And I'm sure you're in a tough position, but honestly, thank you for everything that you do. Um, I would like to move to Tal and ask you, Tal, a little bit about the role of journalism because you know media plays obviously a big role when it comes to crisis, for sure, when it comes to a world pandemic. Can you tell us maybe some trends that you recognize and what do you think all of this means for the media industry? So briefly, I think I'll start with the second part of your question because of some issues that Vlad mentioned before in terms of technology, I guess all of us are wondering right now, maybe the viewers have gotten so much used to this, uh, to watching the low, the low, low cost production right now that eventually networks will try to save costs and channels and just to keep the situation going for a while. In other words, why should we have a makeup artist when, when the anchor or the journalist can, can do his or hers own makeup, just to put it in one sentence as one example. But in terms of global media trends, I think, I, I guess what you pointed out, the question that you brought is, is something that every media outlet around the world is facing right now. And that is really what is the role of the media covering such a pandemic? Usually the role of the media, and Jacob said it before, is to deliver accurate and verified information. We want to keep the information flowing. But right now, I guess uh, media outlets discovered that emphasizing the question marks and emphasizing the element of uncertainty around this pandemic is just as important or sometimes even more important than keep the information, the details of what we do know about this story flowing. So if we have um, medical experts, if you have lawmakers, and even just journalists telling the story, sometimes, and, and let me maybe take it for, uh, like, uh, to, to compare it to covering, let's say, a shooting or a terror attack, something that, unfortunately, uh, many of us working in Israel for many years are very familiar with, a breaking news situation of a terror attack. So we, we, we try to be, to, to be very accurate and and not to speculate too much. You know how careful we are. And, and during such a pandemic, it makes you it makes you think, well, we want to fill up the airtime and pretty much we don't know much about the virus. And pretty much everything that we say right now is sort of a speculation. So so what is the media role in terms of delivering the information and delivering uncertainty, which is also important? And then it brings up another question. What is, the media, what is the media's first objective in, in covering such a pandemic? Is it to keep public, the public safe? Is it to keep the public informed? Um, in that case, should, should a media outlet during such a pandemic become an arm of what we in Israel know as the, the home command? I'll say it in Hebrew, pikuda oref, because you have some public responsibility, I guess, when you have the, the voice. Or just remember, we are, this is an election year, 
and the media, especially in this country, takes a much greater role in, in the absence of campaign rallies. So, so if, if media outlets, which are not really, I'll say, balanced or more liberal or more conservative media outlets, they have a different agenda. So, so the objective right now, it's still an election year, I guess, uh, is, is also to get out the vote in a sense. Um, so how, how do you balance these two? And I, and I think the, the, the dilemma that I'm now describing got reflected in the disinfectant uh, remarks uh, fiasco of, of the president. I, I promise you, Elmo, that I won't get into politics and I, I will keep my word on this. I can see Jacob smiling there. But um, I think for some, for some media outlets, uh, you know, uh, when the objective, and by the way, I think CBS was, was very, did it very well. You know, some media outlets felt more responsible to Trump slate if, if the, the president remarks and, and explain to the public that, hey, hey, the president did not tell you to go and, and inject yourself with, with, with bleach or go drink bleach, but other media outlets uh, whose objective could be more, you know, to, 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 to criticize the administration or, or are thinking more of the election year in this balance, uh, uh, twisted the headline in, in, in a way that serves their main objective or their higher objective. So, so that is one point. And at the same time, it, also in Israel and in the US, media outlets, um, they have to decide, do we want to take Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's briefing or President Trump's briefing uh, and, and cover it for a full one hour? Is it really necessary right now? Because if, if you have a political agenda, then maybe the answer, no, you shouldn't take it live for one hour, two hours now. But if you want to keep the public informed, then maybe you should. So there are many dilemmas and, and it's affecting every media outlets in a, in a different way, I guess. And the dilemma is not only for them, you know, reporting on the data or the coronavirus itself, it's also the agenda behind it. And, um, you know, you compared a little bit the, um, the, the pandemic also to a shooting in Israel or some, some crisis maybe that you have to report on. And I want to move to Vlad because Vlad, you covered also um, Ebola. You covered another disease when you were in Africa, I think back in 2014. So can you share with us a little bit the difference when it comes to coverage between Ebola and the coronavirus? Um, I think the, the, the one big difference is that um, with Ebola, uh, Ebola was, is a much deadlier disease. Uh, you know, if, if you contract, if you contract Ebola, um, your chances are not good. The difference, of course, is that Ebola is very difficult to contract. Um, and, uh, and so when we were tasked uh, with reporting on the Ebola virus and, and, and speaking to doctors and, and going into areas where we uh, potentially might have people who were infected, um, the risks that we took as reporters, as a news organization and elsewhere, you know, with the protection that we wore um, and, and, um, and that we adhered to, uh, gave us a level of protection much in the same way that, you know, if you're covering a natural disaster or you're covering a war, um, you wear protective gear and you hope for the best. You take all the necessary precautions. Um, you know that there's an element of risk, uh, but you, uh, you know, fall back on your training and on the uh, equipment um, and the gear and the security that you have um, to be able, as Jacob and Tal have said, to tell the story uh, objectively without injecting yourself into it. Um, and, and in this case, you're talking about a highly uh, contagious uh, infectious disease, um, of which, uh, you know, at this point, science is, you know, um, has, has been able to study, doctors have been able to study Ebola for quite some time. It's been out, it's been uh, in the world circulating for quite some time. And so uh, there are not as many questions as there are around COVID-19. So the opportunities here, I, I know that there are a lot of reporters who, you know, when this uh, pandemic first broke, they thought to themselves, well, I wanna go to the epicenter where if it's in Wuhan or um, here in New York City, I wanna go to those hospitals where people are experiencing that. But when you started to see medical professionals themselves who take all the precautions um, that, you know, that they know they must take uh, becoming infected, and sadly, even some doctors and nurses and other 
medical professionals or essential workers losing their lives, it changes the calculus a little bit uh, for, for a reporter, certainly, and certainly for a news organization. Um, you know, at, at, at that level, uh, news organizations have to really consider the risk that they are um, potentially taking on in sending a reporter into that area. And so, as you can see, if you watch our, our broadcast, uh, nearly all of us are working from home. Occasionally, we'll do live shots outside. Um, and in one or two instances, there were some hospital um, visits, but, but it's not like what you would see in the case of Ebola or natural disaster or any other um, worry. And I think that's, and I, you know, as, as, as Jacob pointed out, it's difficult because part of you wants to be there. You want to be talking face to face with those individuals. You wanna hear from them. You wanna see if you're talking to somebody who's uh, lost a family member or a loved one, you know, you wanna be able to convey the pain and the suffering that they're going through. And the best way to do that as journalists, obviously, is to be close to somebody, to, um, to really see it in their eyes and to see it in, in the way that they um, uh, engage with you. That's, that's part of the, the, the joy of being a reporter um, um, and, and part of the burden that we have when we're covering really tragic stories is that, you know, for me to be able to properly convey what somebody is going through, I need to be able to tell you, the, the viewer, the audience, you know, this is what, how they, how they expressed to me, or this is what they said to me that I need you to know so that you know how serious this is. And um, you, we're not able to do that in, in, in this way because it's so infectious. So, whereas I think, you know, in 2014, when I was at CNN and they said, you know, you got to go cover Ebola, I think I was a little scared because it's, you know, the way you, the way they, they describe how people die from Ebola sounds, you know, horrific. And so you're, 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 you're worried, but you know that they say, well, no, if you wear this equipment and, um, you know, you, the chances of getting it are, are very difficult. Um, whereas here, you know, a sneeze, a touch, a cough, um, you know, so you, and then you rub your eyes and, and, and next thing you know, you have it. And because the answer is to, um, you know, remember initially we heard, oh, well, children are not, are not susceptible. Now, you know, that may prove to be right. uh, not true. Um, we heard that only, you know, uh, older people um, were uh, going to experience uh, problems. And, and for the most part, that's still true. But then when you read stories of a healthy young 30 year old who's a, you know, personal trainer who succumbs to the virus, it, it changes the calculus um, in a way that, you know, is very different when you know you're going into a, you know, you're going to a, 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 a stronghold of Boko Haram, you know the risks and you, know, you say to yourself, if something really goes down, hopefully I can get out of here. But, but with a, a contagious disease like this, you have no idea if you um, are going to be infected or not until a few days later when you come down with the symptoms. So um, in, in that regard, it, it, it's really been very, very different um, from, from, from Ebola. And I think that's also something that Tal mentioned a little bit, um, before about, you know, how do you report uncertainty? How do you report a disease that you, you don't even know the facts and the data and how do you um, report that to your audience? And um, Jacob, I wanna ask you a little bit more about the ultra-Orthodox um, community, which we mentioned before. So obviously we all know they're going through a very difficult time, but not only now, I think it was also um, before the coronavirus, we saw in New York an increase in anti-Semitic attacks. And I just wanted to ask you, I was wondering if the coverage of coronavirus um, in these communities, if you think it has been biased um, on how the media reports on it, or if you think it was more of a um, fair coverage that also led, you know, rabbis and community leader to, to obey basically to the restrictions. So what do you think? So it's a balance because on one hand, you don't want uh, the media to focus on a specific community uh, because that highlights their vulnerabilities. And in, in this case, uh, it highlighted the vulnerability of the Orthodox community in New York. One, we are, live very dense in small apartments with a lot of kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, uh, we go to shul uh, three times a day and on Shabbos a few times a day, large gatherings where it put us in a position where almost every member of the community could have come in close contact with somebody who had the virus. Thank God, uh, some listened to the guidelines early on in March. And in my case, uh, at, by March 15, I was already quarantined um, at home. So I was tested negative. Um, and that's the case with a lot of people who adhered to the guidelines um, at the very start. 
but a lot of members of the community do not follow politics and news like I do. Uh, they do not have Twitter. They don't um, own a laptop or a smartphone. So the only way of getting their news is either if the rabbis issue a robocall, uh, posters on the street, uh, the weekly newspapers. Uh, if a guideline is given on Sunday, they will only read it on Friday or Saturday. That gives you five or six days where people were not informed about a certain guideline. I'll just point out one, uh, the order by Governor Cuomo uh, to wear masks was given on the first day of the second days of Passover. You know, we all observed it. Uh, I uh, got my email at the end of the holiday. So I knew that the coming morning we are required to wear masks, but most of the members of the community do not listen to radio, do not watch TV. Uh, they're also, uh, they're very limited with information because most of the guidance is given in English and Yiddish is their um, home language. So that put me in a situation where I had to provide uh, a lot of information to the community uh, based on the knowledge that I got, but it also put me sort of as a bridge to the community between the elected officials uh, actually issuing these guidelines and conveying it to the community. So I think in that matter, uh, local authorities failed in outreach, failed number one, to issue clear guidance on what social distancing is, how it prevents uh, people from contracting the virus, but also how important it is to stay home, not together, this is not, an imposition of a certain um, guideline to restrict religious services. It's actually a matter of saving lives. And so that is where local authorities fail in conveying that message, but also communicating in a very clear way that this is a matter of life and death. And by staying home, by adhering to all those restrictions, we are saving ourselves. In the beginning, it was very hard because people were in shock. Uh, you read reports that a funeral home here in Borough Park where uh, a regular day, there are two um, on a weekend, maybe three funerals uh, on every given day uh, from March 15 um, into April 15, you had 15, 20 to 25 funerals uh, on a single day. And so people were in an immediate shock and you know, uh, stayed at home. Uh, they didn't violate those rules. Uh, but as reports come in, there's an, a decrease uh, uh, in the numbers that, you know, not everybody who contracted actually uh, dies. People are not taking it as serious. And so you have this constant uh, reporting of people uh, violating social distance, but you don't have the reporting of 80 to 90% of members of the community acting as responsible citizens in saving lives. So to go back to your question, um, the media focusing on our community actually helped our community uh, in trying to save lives because had they not been <laughs> spotlighted, people wouldn't know how serious this matter is or would think, you know what? Government said you have to wear a seatbelt. I'm going to defy um, those rules. I'm going to pass a red light. But if you know that you're going to save a loved one or that if you go to shul or go to a certain gathering that you will personally be impacted by that, you start listening to those guidelines. So it actually highlighted it and saved lives. And that's um, really good to know because I was expecting a different answer, to be honest. So thanks for sharing that. And, you know, if we're already talking about communicating um, with different audiences, then maybe Tal, you can tell us a little bit about what it's like to report to different audiences because you're doing still today from New York um, Israeli shows as well as American shows. So can you tell us a little bit about the differences in terms of um, how they, how Israeli audiences and American capture coronavirus? I will start with the first weeks after the major outbreak here in the U.S. And I think Israel was ahead two weeks before, two and a half weeks before. 
And I was under the impression, maybe all of you feel, feel the same, that there is some twisted competition in the world. Who has less deaths, right? Uh, wh where do you see most coronavirus cases? Where are they most restricting individual liberties? And I think the media coverage often reflects this very weird and twisted competition. And I'll, I'll explain why. Sometimes I, I'm under the feeling that people sitting at home in Israel watching reports from here in the US, um, they, they use the media as, as a tool that will make them feel better about their own situations. Like, oh, look over there in the US, mm -hmm, what, what's happening there in New York? I'm so much better off to be here in Tel Aviv. So that is one aspect of that. Um, in Sweden, for example, I, I just interviewed two, two days ago a, a Swedish um, economy expert, but he told me that the media there is uh, helping to encourage some sort of some, some sentiment of nationalism around the way that they chose because Sweden is one of the countries that never forced its population into uh, you know lockdowns. So so by the way the Swedish media, for example, covers what happens in certain parts of the U.S. or certain parts of the world, it makes the Swedish population feel better about themselves. Now in Israel, I think it's pretty interesting because when it comes to the exit strategy or the stimulus package, the media coverage of these aspects are being used as a tool to put pressure, I think, on the government, meaning look what they're doing in the U.S. The administration already gave $1,200 to each American family. What, what's happening with us? Where, where are we? Um, so there is that as, as, uh, as well. And I think when it comes to differences, I guess the, 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 if I'm bringing up the stimulus package, then that is where I see the most difference. But not only now during the pandemic, but also in general, when it comes to uh, reports about economy, economic situation, that, then I think that American anchors and journalists, they tend to ask much better questions, unfortunately, than, than what I see on uh, on Israeli television, I think even even if, if you watch I don't know some some random liberal anchor here, um, you know they will still ask tougher pose tougher questions to to lawmakers um, and and economy experts when it comes to financial issues than in Israel where the media sometimes uh, tries to reflect the voice of 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 the the, the public you know uh, the the small citizen to. Uh, th that's the Israeli sentiment. The media feels as if it, it reflects, it's not taking a neutral position. It's like, we are the representatives of, of, of the public, um, of the shulmani, I'll say it in Hebrew. There's this, this new uh, independent contractors group that's very popular in Israel. Um, I, I also find that there are a lot of misconceptions in Israel. So, so when I wrote columns during the pandemic, for example, to Israel Ayom, one of the Israeli papers, I always try to find something with a twist, something that in Israel they don't know so much. And, 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 and I think the U.S. health system, by the way, is, is one of the biggest misconceptions um, outside this country. In Israel, they have this impression that the U.S., health system is a beacon of free market. And if, if you don't have, uh, you know, enough dollars, you'll just, you'll die from coronavirus. You can't have a test on the street. Whereas, you know, people were very much surprised when I wrote about it that, uh, you know, when, when I moved here, I was very shocked that it's not so easy to get health insurance as an individual, you know, where you want it, when you want it, for how much you want it. In fact, you have a very narrow window of 45 days a year in which you can do it. These are things that in Israel, for example, people don't know, although they do think that they know everything about um, health in, in the U.S. From, from stories, from the way it's been covered by the media. So that's one sense. Thank you, Tal. Um, and I'm going to move now to the questions because we already have a few questions from the viewers. The first one is directed to Vlad. but. Um, to everyone, if you have anything that you want to ask a general question or one of the panelists, you're more than welcome to put them in the chat box. So Vlad, the question I received here for you is, were you in any situation during COVID-19 where you prevented yourself from reporting a story that was either too pessimistic or scary? Uh, no, um, you know, uh, that's never been the case of any story that I've uh, reported. Um, um, you know, it, it's not my place, um, nor is it my role to influence the coverage um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, my role is uh, to 
to tell the story and to share the facts. In fact, and I would say that um, the biggest challenge um, uh, throughout this pandemic, and I'm sure uh, Jacob and Ta will, will, will can add to this, has been um, the battle of misinformation, um, which you know has uh, uh, become a real concern, I think, um, and it will continue to become a real concern um, as this pandemic endures, because on one hand, you have uh, guidance that has been established by medical professionals that the federal government has engaged with to provide guidance to the citizenry, the citizenry and, 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 and then you have um, campaigns of misinformation sometimes that uh, begin um, at, uh, within the White House itself. Um, and, uh, and those two forces are constantly pulling and tugging at each other. And it, it's kind of it's interesting to me that, uh, that in the past, it, it has struck me that um, uh, when the world, and I, and I kind of think of this now as a collective struggle um, uh, around the world. It's not just an American problem or an Israeli problem or you know, a Chinese problem. It, it's a global problem, uh, this pandemic. And uh, the race to find a vaccine will benefit all of humanity, much in the same way that smallpox vaccine uh, benefited humanity and, and the discovery of ways to prevent um, uh, people uh, from dying of, 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 of of AIDS um, and the virus that causes AIDS, I think is going to uh, help humanity. So what's been really fascinating as a reporter and as a student of history is to observe how perhaps the first time, and maybe the, the history books will be different a few years down the road, but it strikes me that um, in, in the past, the world has come together to face a global threat, whether it's the threat of Nazism or, you know, um, um, you know imperialism, whatever it is, the Spanish, uh, the flu of 1918, the same thing, the world comes together and they figure out a solution um, and it benefits uh, everybody. And here for the first time, it strikes me that perhaps we're not on that same path, that there are, um, as Tal pointed out, uh, various groups that are seeking for whatever uh, reasons, political uh, agendas, often um, economic ones to uh, try and misinform the people as to what the real threats are or, or not. Um, there, there are some instances, there are some communities or some countries that have been able to combat the, the, the threat of the pandemic, um, like South Korea, uh, like Singapore and others that have done uh, remarkably well. Um, and, and you should be able to share those instances and what they're doing and how they're doing it and what makes it successful or not successful um, with the people who uh, consume the news, and I feel like this time around, it um, is very different. I feel like everybody is sort of hunkering down, as I, I think Tom mentioned. You know, countries reporting, you know, the number of people that have died or not died, and comparing it to other countries, or comparing infection rates to other countries, which um, does make it sometimes feel as if it's a competition. And the competition should be to, in my, this is one of the few times I'll state my opinion. Um, the competition I think should be to find a vaccine. Um, that will, I think, benefit everybody. I agree with okay. that too, and hopefully we'll find <laughs> one soon. Um, I have two more questions and then we're going to conclude. So Jacob, this one is for you, um, also from the viewers. What positive opportunities has the lockdown, the lockdown brought that will likely continue when things begin to open up? Maybe if there's anything more positive. For myself? I'm not sure if they ask for yourself, but generally so you, you can answer whatever way you like. <laughs> so I'll go a little personal. Uh, first of all, it has provided me um, a unique opportunity to number one, uh, broaden my expertise uh, in the field of um, news, uh, journalism especially. Um, until now, when I started, uh, it was focusing on Jewish related stuff, which, you know, is either a controversy uh, here in New York City, uh, when it comes to politics, it's mostly only controversies. It's statements by politicians or controversial policies. And so by uh, entering myself in a situation where I have to provide my readers, but also uh, be informed on certain positions that I've never dealt with, just gave me a little more to understand what people do on a daily basis, but also talk to different people, talk, talk to experts, find um, new sources uh, of information for uh, my work along the road. Um, secondly, not going out, not having drinks with friends and not meeting people um, 
on, on the train, uh, not being able to upload every day on Instagram pictures of what I uh, uh, witness on the street is, is, you know, a little discouraging. On the other hand, participating in events on Zoom or uh, observing uh, certain events which would take me either a flight or special RSVP, or it would be deemed off the record and therefore I wouldn't um, have access to that event. Right now, by having most of these discussions, events online, uh, it just you know gives me an opportunity to follow more uh, the topics that I usually cover. Uh, thirdly, um, as um, Almog said, um, obviously because Israel is unfortunately forming a government, I'm saying unfortunately just for myself because I love um, elections. And so for me, uh, it has impacted me that I have to move on. And so if I move on uh, to cover um, a government in formation right now, new policies, new people to profile, it also uh, gives me an opportunity to present my readers with new information, profiles of new individuals, and new policy discussions. You know, over the past four years, we have heard so much about certain individuals that I'm pretty sure most of the participants here want to move on. They want to hear about new individuals um, and new information. And so by broadening my expertise, by attending uh, certain virtual events that I couldn't have attended um, had I um, had we not been uh, in this lockdown gave me an opportunity to uh, you know focus on a ton of work and I can't sleep so if you know this uh, gives me more work uh, that's a positive that is definitely a positive. And um, about the elections, no joke. Every time we have an election and, um, you know, we also vote inside the consulate. So usually I would invite um, journalists for a briefing about the elections or to come and cover the votes. And, you know, the third time it starts getting a bit embarrassing sending out those emails. <laughs> but they might be the third time. Jacob. So Jacob is always the one to say, yeah, I'll come, no problem. <laughs> So um, I'm moving now to one more question for Tal, and then we have a general question for everyone and we'll wrap it up. Um, Tal, one of our viewers wants to know if there was a time where, you know, in this transition into the virtual world, um, where you were going live or, you know, um, doing a story where something didn't go as planned. Um, and we're also curious to know what the Israeli sports channel wanted to know. <laughs> All right. So uh, something that didn't go as planned is some is uh, something that I am actually activating right now. When this is that do not disturb mode, which is really important. I was about to go. I, I oh I was already live on air, and I'm since I'm using my phone and I place it on a tripod. Um, I'm, I'm using my phone right now. By the way, uh, I, I didn't know that when I'm on air. I didn't think about it. I guess I, I can still get. Oh, so I was on air with Shalom Gals, a uh, very popular uh, show on Channel 13, prime time in Israel. And I'm on air and then somebody calls me and the live just, uh, oops, you know, and then go and explain what happened. Uh, so now I know, do not disturb mode and you can define uh, what you want to be included <laughs> in it. So, and the other thing, the sports channel, well, okay, there's so much to say. Uh, first, they want to know, um, they want to know about the strategies over here about when, what the NFL is planning on doing. They want to know um, what, what, what the NBA, because the NBA first, went, when they when they uh, paused the season, they put everything on hold. I think that was sort of, it came from the sports world, if we remember, you know, right, right in the first weeks of, of the outbreak. So I guess the NBA, what Adam Silver did, the commissioner, it sort of paved the way for the entire U.S. economy to shut down. I think the NBA was was really on. They were really on top of this. And then after Adam Silver, then came other sports leagues that, that did the same. Uh, so so I think the, the Israeli uh, is Sport Chamesh, uh, Sports Five. They really also followed the story from the, the pandemic story and how the U.S. reaction is, is is shaping the policy and the strategy in the U.S. 
following the, 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 the NBA, the NBA's lead. Um, they want to know many things. There was the auction of Kobe Bryant's personal, uh, you know, memorabilia. So I talked about that as well. Uh, I just interviewed the executive vice president of uh, football operations at the NFL, Troy Vincent. And uh, he also had interesting things to say about um, what's the season is going to look like for rookies and that this is the time to learn the playbook. So th there's a lot of things to talk about, even in the absence of real sports. Sounds good. Thanks for that, Tal. Um, so one last question for the three of you. So we can finish with a little bit positivity, of course, and go forward into a better world. Um, the viewers would like to know what keeps you going through this tough time. What keeps you going? Jacob, you like personal stories. So how about we start with you? Uh, seeing all of you online. <laughs> <laughs> it warms my heart too, trust me. And thank you. Thank you everyone for participating. Tal, what keeps you going through this tough time? It's very corny, but it's love. <laughs> really, it, it's love. And it's, uh, I, I also really, I am really waiting for the summer because I'm really hoping that I can go back to Israel. I haven't been there for over a year. I'm looking forward towards that. It. It's um, right now I'm still waiting because I know that if you go to Israel, you have to be quarantined for 14 days. So hopefully I'll be able to do it this summer. By the way, um, Vlad, when was the last time you were in Israel? Oh, man, last time I was in Israel was in 2013, and I miss it immensely. It was one of the best assignments I ever had um, as a reporter, and I struggled mightily with um, uh, whether or not to throw my hat in the ring to become, if you recall, you might be a little young, but back in uh, 2010, 2011, Sarah Seidner, who's still a CNN correspondent, was the- in Chicago. Yeah, exactly. But she was the correspondent based in Jerusalem at the time. Um, and I, she she broke her leg or something and she went back to California. And that's how I got assigned to um, uh, be based out, out of Jerusalem. And I thought long and hard about uh, becoming the permanent correspondent there. Uh, that's how much I enjoyed my time uh, reporting uh, in Israel. Um, and it was it was a really wonderful experience. So I, I, I miss it uh, immensely. My, my parents actually just went recently and they had a blast. Um, what keeps me going is, um, so I'm going to temper the, 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 um, the, the very beautiful sentiments echoed by my colleagues. Uh, and I echo and share their sentiment, but also I, um, I try not to let, you know, as the numbers rise, uh, not just here in the United States, but around the world, and you start to hear them, you know, 50,000, and then you say oh, 60,000, more than the United States lost in the Vietnam War then 70,000, and now we're headed towards 80,000. And then you hear that, you know, it could potentially be 150. No one knows, right? And I think what can happen just for all of us, because we're human beings, is we become desensitized to those numbers. We, you know, as the people start to, as the weather gets nicer and people want to get out of their homes and, and enjoy um, the life that they had before this, you know, um, you hear a news report and, they, and somebody says, you know, 80,000 people have died from uh, this pandemic. Um, it's, it, it, you, you know, you, you, you don't connect to that number because you've been hearing it over and over again for the last, you know, two months. I, I try every time um, to think about uh, the, the families and the people who've lost their loved ones um, and, 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 and the people who are affected directly by this, uh, people in, in communities like the one you described, Jacob, where um, you know you're not always um, aware of what is happening within those communities. Um, and when I when you mentioned that statistic of the number of of, of uh, funerals that, that were happening on a given weekend, uh, you know that, that's just absolutely horrific. And I try to think about that as I go about doing my day, uh, as I go about uh, doing my job, um, because I never want to lose sight of that. I never want to lose sight of, of the people that are really um, directly impacted by, by what is happening. On the flip side, I try to, as much as I can, share um, stories. Uh, a lot of the reporting that I've been doing lately for CBS This Morning has been around, you know, um, more lighthearted stories that sort of um, highlight what people are doing to get through this. So um, whether it's a, you know, a couple that gets married 
um, you know, mm -hmm. at a socially distant, um, acceptable manner um, in the streets or, you know, children uh, visiting their grandparents behind a, a glass door and waving to their grandparents. Um, one thing I've noticed is that human beings are incredibly resilient and creative. The amount of creativity that is bubbling up in this pandemic as people are trying to figure out ways to do things, television shows that are being created in living rooms. I don't mean mainstream TV shows. I mean, people put posting things on Instagram and TikTok um, is, is just remarkable. And, and um, you know, it just sort of reminds me that even in the worst of times, beautiful things can happen. Love can flourish, creativity can abound. And so I've been sharing a lot of those stories on CBS this morning. Um, and so that also keeps me going. So um, it's sort of twofold. If I can reclaim my time, <laughs> I, want to end, I want to end with an impression of being a serious person. Uh, so, I mean, we we all we've all been impact impacted by this. You know, everybody is complaining about uh, being home all the time. And again, as I shared with you, for me, it's extremely um, um, uh, impactful. I think that if we go and look back. And if we know that with our reporting or with us being home and restricted from doing stuff that we usually do, that we even saved one life, I think nothing else matters. I think we should be uh, all uh, thankful that we were given this opportunity of not only uh, watching on ourselves, not only watching on our loved ones, but also saving lives. And that's what matters. Thank you, Jacob. And um, I think it's really good that we're finishing on this note of gratitude and, you know, taking this time, uh, not taking it for granted and really doing a little bit of soul searching and, and looking at the positive side of what, uh, what it brings to our personal life and also to the world. And I want to thank first um, the amazing, amazing media team of the consulate. So thank you very much. Noe Aslav, who was responsible for this whole panel and project. So we're clapping, your, clapping our hands for you. And thank you very much, um, Kara Ford, who's, by the way, I think your identical twin sister was before on the screen and it's really confusing. So next time, just let me know. And uh, thank you so much, Tali Golshev. We were worried about her dog barking in the background, but <laughs> it was quiet. So it's all good. And thank you very much, Valy El Mizrahi, who joined us also um, a few months ago and came right from Israel to New York in the midst of coronavirus. So thank you everyone for participating. Um, you're more than welcome to follow our panelists on Twitter and of course watching them um, on TV or reading what they write. Thank you so much and we'll conclude here. Thank you Tal, thank you Vlad and thank you Jacob. Have a good day and a good evening. Bye everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you.